paper talking about assumptions. I think this is the new stuff. So let's pick up on slide 22 of lecture 5. So just a reminder, something that Re Reviewer 3 may ask you about and something that you should probably be thinking about any ahead of any time. Um, there's good news and bad news with all the stuff that you're learning. The good news is that you can think of these as building blocks. So how to put predictors in a model, how to talk about what they mean, how to describe their effect size and test their significance, these are skills that translate into almost any kind of statistical model. That's the good news. The bad news is that the samples of data that most of you are likely to be working with may need a different kind of model to be able to use these techniques accurately. So the general linear model is designed for situations in which you have a quantitative outcome whose residuals are supposed to be normally distributed. So there's a lot of kinds of variables that you might want to predict as outcomes whose residuals aren't going to be normal. And that's where the world of generalized linear models comes in. The other thing, um, the big deal, I would say the big, the worst one that you could violate is independence. So if your people come to you in some sort of naturally formed group, like you have multiple kids sampled from multiple families or multiple kids from multiple schools or multiple teachers from multiple schools, like anything like that, the people who are part of the same group, their residuals are likely to be more related to each other than people who are part of different groups. And that screws up your standard errors and it also screws up some of your uh, the slope estimates. So that's what the world of multi-level models or what's known as mixed effects models are for. Those are the upper level classes that I teach for those situations. What ends up happening in those models is that you have to have built into the model a, a different type of E for every dimension that you've sampled over. So like if you were collecting data from schools and you had children from different classrooms. So the differences between classrooms would have like its own E for why some classes do better than others. And within a classroom, children would have their own E for why some kids do better than other kids from the same class. So there'd be two different kinds of variability that the model's trying to predict simultaneously. And that builds in a correlation of the residuals from people from the same group. So if you're in that situation, you cannot use these models as I've described them. You got to add stuff to it. But the, but the techniques you're learning directly translate. Once you get the multiple E's set up, everything else translates very much the same. Um, the other part of it that goes along with normality is constant variance. And so generalized linear models um, that have different types of outcome variables built into them have solutions for non-constant variance as well. So just to sort of the, the caveat that GLM is not a one-stop shop for everything, but the idea of how you put predictors in is general. It does work beyond that. Um, and other things that people may point out in terms of things we're assuming, all of our observed variables um, we're assuming are measured without error. We may calculate a reliability coefficient for, say, a sum score or something like that, but we don't do anything about it. We would be like, my, my measure of this characteristic for my people has an alpha coefficient for reliability of 0.8. Ta-da! And I move on to stick it in the model. Um, the idea that you may want to combine multiple sources of information and extract what is common across them to better represent a construct, a variable, that's the basis of what's known as structural equation modeling. I'm, that's the, the course that I teach after this one right now, and it's coming back next fall. So those models um, are designed to better address the measurement error that would occur in any one observed variable that we're ignoring here. Um, we're also assuming that all predictors have their effects specified correctly. So we're assuming that a predictor has a linear effect if that's all the kind of slope you put in. We're assuming it has a quadratic effect if that's the kind of slope you put in. And so we can test that by adding other terms that would change the, sh the slope or the type of slope and see if they help the model. 
Um, and anything you haven't included is assumed to be zero. That's always the case. And if you haven't measured it, then you can't do anything about it. So these are just some caveats. Um, here are some things that you may hear about from picky reviewers that are not actually problems. Multicollinearity. Have you heard this term before? Yeah, it's yeah, it's spelled different ways. I'm not even sure which is correct. <laughs> I love that the face is like, what? Either collinearity with one L or two L's or multicollinearity. Um, all of those words mean the same thing. It's someone who is concerned about the extent to which your predictors are correlated. They're very concerned about that. Um, so you may see statistics given in output for general linear, linear modeling programs that give things like tolerance, which is the amount of variance in the predictor that is unique to the predictor, or variance inflation factor, which is a ratio of tolerance. Um, this is not a thing. So I would recommend that um, in your response to reviews, I wouldn't quote uh, Lisa Hoffman, personal communication, this is not a thing. Um, they will not be swayed by that argument. But what you can say is that, yeah, if you have predictors that are highly related to each other, their standard errors will be higher because it's harder to pin down what is unique if they are completely overlapping doesn't mean you can't try, it just means that that's the reality of the predictors that you've included. The only instance in which it is truly a problem, and you will know because you will get dots where your slope is supposed to be on your output, is a condition known as singularity, and that is when you have predictors that are perfectly correlated or are linearly dependent. So for instance, if you have a measure that has three subscales and you put in each of the three subscales as a predictor in your model, and then you compute a total of the three and you add that as a fourth predictor, you will break your model because the fourth is the same thing as the other three. That's singularity. So as long as you don't do that, you're okay. Uh, People. Another uh, troubleshooting slash investigative thing that you may be asked to look at is leverage. The idea that certain people, based on their values of the predictors or the outcome, have more influence on the regression line. So here's a picture that is illustrating each of these different uh, terminologies. So if a case, a person, has undue, um, has an extreme value of E. So like cases A and C, relative to everybody else, they're further off the line. We would call that distance. Leverage is cases that have extreme values on the predictor, like B, who's up here. And influence is the big one. That's cases that have an undue influence on the slope. So like person C out here, if they weren't here, the slope would be more positive, like they're dragging the line down. Whereas like person B is, is an outlier. They, they look like they're away from the distribution, but the line was already heading out there anyway. So B isn't having undue influence on the slope. It's the combination of where you are on X and Y that matters. You may ask for, as part of your output, a diagnostic for each case as to how much undue influence they have, um, since, such as a statistic known as Cook's D, which gives you how far different the slope would be without that case. So it's easy to find, you know, to look at a scatter plot in this instance or to compute these things and see people who look like they're having a stronger effect on the, on the slope solution than other people. The question is what to do about it. So some people might say, well, C looks like they have um, extreme influence. Let's get rid of them. Do you think I should be allowed to just kick people out of my data set? It's like, well, I want my slope to be more this way. So you're gone and you're gone and you're gone. It's like, no, it's not tailoring, 
right? You don't get to like nip and tuck your data until it fits perfectly the way that you want it to. Like that is not cool. Now the question would be, why is C like that? Do they give you some indication that their data is untrustworthy? Right? Do they have, say, a response time for a task that should have taken three seconds that took 10 minutes, like they're not paying attention? Or did they report that they smoke 18,000 cigarettes a day? Right? Like something to where it's like, okay, I don't believe you, and that's why you're not going to be in my model. But your value is inconvenient for me is not a good reason to kick someone out. And so it's, it's hard to come up with a standard for what is too much that would allow you to kick out cases when someone else could look at the same set of data and come to a different conclusion as to where the line should be drawn as to who gets kicked out and who doesn't. So this is so-called outlier analysis. I would encourage you not to go down the road of kicking people out of your data. It's, it's hard to justify where the line should be. Instead, you can switch models. So there is a technique that I teach in the generalized class that's known as quantile regression. So do you remember all the way back to like week one in this class and we talked about measures of central tendency? Remember that? Ever since then, that has fallen off the planet, right? We're all about the mean and the variance. But there was another one that, that we used to indicate central tendency that also started with an M. There were actually two more. Do you remember those? The 50 50th percentile? Yeah, median and mode. Yeah, well, mode is gone too, by the way. Mode has left the building. Mode is canceled for the rest of the semester, but median. So what if instead of predicting um, the mean for each person, we predicted the median. That's the basis of what's known as quantile regression, and the median is much less susceptible to outliers and skewness and all that stuff. And actually, you can predict any quantile that you want to. You can predict the 25th percentile or the 75th or whatever. So there are techniques that are more robust to outliers that work the exact same way, um, under the hood, the difference between what, what quantile regression does and what this does is rather than minimizing the squared sum of residuals, it minimizes the absolute value of residuals. So it's a different optimization, but it's based on kind of the same ideas. Um, there's not handy dandy formulas for standard errors. You have to do it via uh, resampling techniques, but that nowadays computers do that within a second or two. So if you're in a situation in which you have um, randos that are messing with your slopes, right, and you're not sure whether you should kick them out or not, I would do a quantile regression instead to address that problem. Lisa? Um, yeah, go ahead. Can you go back? Sure. Um, so when you're looking at these, like, weird cases, is that something that, like, you like look at the plot and like try and be like, hmm, this like C looks really far out, B looks really far out, or like, is there a more systemic way to be like, this person is an outlier? Um, I would the, I would ask the systemic way would be to ask the program to calculate the Cook's D or something like it for each individual case. So and you just like iterative run every single case? No, it does it. It calculates okay. this for you. Um, it, it would be an option somewhere in the code for the model to ask it to add this additional column to your data set. And then you would run descriptive statistics and sort of look to see if there's any people who have a lot bigger D value than other people. Mm. Okay, so Cook's D, it essentially runs it for each participant then. It runs Got it, it without each participant to see how different right, the right, results right. would be. Yeah. Right, so that it's, makes sense. Yeah, okay. it's, an, it's an index of how much you're dragging the line. Right, because any one Perfect. person shouldn't be able to drag the line more than other people. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. And ideally, no one's dragging the line, and you're fine. Um, in reality, you know, there's always going to be one or two people, and it's like, well, do I do I kick out the, just this person or both of these people? And then it's, it becomes, you know, eh. so. Mm -hmm. eh. Perfect. Thank you. Technical term. Yeah. Okay. Uh, su suppression. We talked about that earlier. Um, suppression is a condition in which the unique effect of a variable is actually stronger than their bivariate effect 
yes, it can happen. Um, here are the situations in which it can happen. Um, given that there is a bivariate effect of two predictors, then if this mathematical equation is true, this one or this one, and number C is an example of what I have here below. So it looks like the predictors have a stronger relationship when they're combined in the same model than it looked like they had previously. And that can happen if they have a negative correlation. It's not something to worry about, it just looks surprising. There's nothing you can do about it, doesn't mean you screwed anything up. But what it does mean is that if you have a predictor that is not correlated in the first place, doesn't mean it isn't going to be part of your model. A bivariate relationship is not a gatekeeper for inclusion because this kind of weird shit can happen. Other weird shit that can happen. So this is an example in which, so here's a correlation table. This is SPSS output, by the way, that I borrowed from uh, Cal Garbin at the University of Nebraska to make this point. Here is Y, and the first column here is the correlation of five different predictors. None of them is significantly correlated with Y. Nevertheless, if you put them in the same model at the same time, the model actually is significant. So again, making the point just because something's not related by itself doesn't tell you necessarily what's going to happen when you put it together with other things. This is more likely to happen when the predictors don't have much correlation. And so each of them gets a strong, unique contribution. Um, here is an example of what's called null washout. So if I have one predictor here that's related to Y and none of the others are, and I dump them all in the same model, this model is not significant. Even though it has one predictor that is significant, the rest of these crappy predictors are dragging it down. Because your F test is a test of information that you have over information left over, but it's per slope. So if I have one good slope and eight crappy slopes, then my per slope contribution is being dragged down by the eight crappy ones. So it looks like the model is no good, even though there is a significant predictor in it. So the test of the model is not necessarily the only thing you should be paying attention to. It's what does each predictor contribute. Um, and so that's the, the, uh, the summary, the end of the story here, which is perfect because we have two minutes left. And this is the point where I say, do you have any questions? No, really, do you have any questions? No, we're good. We're like, no, I'm done, Lisa. You say bye-bye now, I wanna go. Okay, I say bye-bye now. Uh, please, guys, stay inside, stay safe. It is dangerous out there. Uh, let me know if you need anything, and I will see you after Thanksgiving, unless you want to come hang out with me during office hours on Tuesday. So if anybody wants help with homework or to review anything, uh, 1230 to 445 on Tuesday. Otherwise, see you in like a week and a half. All right.